Well, th thank you, first of all, Ali, for the introduction, and thank you for everyone for choosing to, to be here today. I think um, this conversation comes at a time that is extremely crucial for us to have. Um, as you know, the last seven months have been traumatic and, and really heartbreaking for everybody, not least of all the people on the ground who are facing danger day after day after day. But I think the danger that is equally important that we need to think about is what this conflict has done to the rest of the world. And um, what we're seeing is that it has revealed uh, and exposed old fractures, it has deepened divisions, and it has divided people along new battle lines. And I think that that is a very dangerous situation because one of the most dangerous features of our world today is polarization. Polarization leads to binary thinking. It makes us think of our world as us versus them, left versus right, east versus west. And even though that kind of might give us a false sense of security that we belong in a certain camp, but it actually inadvertently really puts constraints on us because it kind of limits the way we think, what we should do, what we should say, and more importantly, it makes us look at everybody outside our camp as the rival, as right. the enemy, somebody you can erase, somebody you can dismiss. And actually, studies have shown that as humans, we are instinctively more uh, likely to be attuned to the suffering of people who are like us. And that kind of selective empathy is actually quite, has real uh, terrible, actually, real, uh, real life consequences because it affects where we look and what we see. Yeah. And this is happening in this conflict. People are feeling so emotional about it. People are in either this camp or that camp. And I've seen the middle ground sort of shrink year after year after year. And, you know, when it comes to the Palestinians, I think they've been pushed to the periphery where their suffering has become almost unnoticed and where they become almost a people on whom anything can happen without consequence. And that's why it's important for us to actually find that middle ground, to find that third way. It's so dangerous when we reduce people to just you know, a nationality or skin color or political views because as human beings, we're so much more complex than that. And so I think what I want to say at the outset is that I don't want, I'm not here to try to change anybody's mind. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything I want to achieve is for people to come out of this uh, thinking that there is more to this issue, that it is actually complex and that it needs to be approached with a lot of nuance, and for us to try to find the third way. It's neither, it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to be either pro-Israel, pro-Palestine. There needs to be a middle ground. And I think one thing that we can start off as a middle ground is maybe agree on three things. First of all, that the current status quo is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable for Palestinians or for Israelis. Second, that peace cannot be achieved through violence, through wars, through weapons. It has to be achieved through negotiations, political process, even handedness and commitment. And the third thing that we need to remember is that the majority of people who are suffering from this conflict on both sides are just ordinary people mm -hmm. who want the same things that we all want to just live in safety with the people that we love, uh, for our children to have access to health care, education, to a better future. Jordan has had uh, a peaceful relationship uh, and a fairly functional relationship with Israel for some time. Mm -hmm. So to some degree, you've seen the model of how it can work. Mm -hmm. Given how extreme and how polarized we are now, mm -hmm. is your sense of a future for uh, an Israeli people and a Palestinian people that is safe and secure, are we farther away from it or could it actually happen? Well, if you ask most people, they roll their eyes and they'll say, you know, the two-state solution is dead, that this conflict is intractable. And it is probably the most intractable uh, conflict of our era, but it's because, not because we don't know what needs to be done, but because there's been a lack of seriousness and commitment and political will to get it done and the approach hasn't been the most productive kind of approach. So for those people who say, you know, it can't be done, I'll say, well, again, point one, the status quo is not sustainable. Right. So what is the alternative? Is the alternative uh, an endless occupation? Um, how will Israel continue to manage that? Will they continue just to use security measures? 
If that's the case, then any time there's a peace in Israel, then that's just going to be the lull, it's going to be the calm before the storm until the next cycle of violence happens. Is it going to be a one-state solution? But then what does that look like? Does that become like a, an apartheid state? Is it that we're going to send, um, you know, let them go to, to, to Jordan, let them go to Egypt? That is actually, you know, Jordan has said before that we reject any attempts to transfer uh, the population of, uh, of Palestine and to drive them away from their homes or their, or their land. And another wave of refugees will, will actually be amount to another Nakba, which the Arab world does not w want to see. And I, people need to understand when they say, why don't you take them, which is something that we hear quite often. They need to understand what they're asking for. The forcible transfer of an occupied population is a war crime. And we don't want to be participants in that. Uh, it is called ethnic cleansing. And, and, and Palestinians do not want to uh, be part of Jordan or Jordan to be part of Palestine. So that option is not on the table. So is it endless occupation? What is it? The only way is for a two-state solution. Uh, but we need to look at what we did in the past and, and try to understand why we failed. And part of it is that you know we need to understand that it cannot be done by the Palestinians and Israelis alone. And the US plays a very important role because it is the single most powerful country in terms of its leverage on Israel. And uh, it, so it, it depends how much the US is willing to use its political capital to, uh, to hold Israel accountable. Now, in the past, what used to happen is in negotiations, they used to always start off by on the premise of what will Israel accept to do? What are the terms that it will agree on? Not what is required from Israel to do at the bare minimum as dictated by international law. So, so the starting point needs to be a legal framework that is recognized by the international community. And then a commitment from the US to hold Israel accountable when it doesn't stick to the terms, of course, as, the, as well as the Palestinians. Now, you know, a lot of people would, would see what I'm saying as, you know, but the US is Israel's strongest ally. I am not asking for the US to turn against Israel. Uh, uh, but you, to be a good ally, you call your ally out when they're not doing the right thing. Being a good ally doesn't mean you just sign off on anything and everything your friend does. Um, and if I was the United States today, and I was looking at what's happening in, in Israel, a country that I care about and that's my ally, I would be saying, like, whatever, is, is this war making Israel safer? And whatever um, Israel achieves in terms of short-term tactical gains against Hamas, aren't they coming at a very heavy long-term cost towards Israel's security? Isn't it coming at a heavy cost in terms of the reputational damage that has happened to Israel, the image that has happened, the way that it's distanced Israel from many of its allies? And so, and there, is this war the best way to achieve Israel's long-term security. As the United States, am I gonna prioritize the political agenda and survival of one man, the Prime Minister, and the uh, ideological, uh, uh, ultra-nationalist, religious uh, far right that exists in his cabinet, am I gonna be prioritizing their agenda over the long-term safety and security of the State of Israel? And so sometimes, you know, holding Israel accountable is actually in the best interest of the people of Israel and their long-term uh, interest. And so, again, you know, it is not just about trying to persuade Israel to do the right thing. It is about actually there needs to be consequences when one side of the uh, negotiations, uh, negotiating uh, parties are not sticking to the terms of the negotiation. So I do believe that the only way that uh, we can achieve security in our part of the world is through a negotiated peace where Palestinians ha have not a promise of statehood, but an actual statehood. They can't be given just a, a package of a patchwork of an emasculated state without any symbols of sovereignty. They need to have control over their own lives, self-determination, autonomy. Uh, they've been living under occupation, 
oppression and dispossession for too long. And when we look at whose fault it is in this cycle or that cycle, we can keep going back and forth, but it all comes back down to an illegal occupation. You want safety and security, we need to end the occupation because you cannot have a safe and secure Israel while there is a grave injustice on their border. What do people, we have a very influential audience here. Um, these, these are uh, philanthropists, business leaders, and investors. If someone wants to make this, the outcome of this better, mm -hmm. What can people do? Because we see this playing out on the international stage and it, it makes people feel impotent. There are these prevailing narratives which you have, uh, have discussed with us. What should influential Americans I do I think about it's, not, it's to just not think of just the narratives. You know, I saw this uh, video recently of um, Mitt Rom Senator Mitt Romney asking uh, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken, about how, how did Israel get the PR wrong this time? And I was struck by the question because I think the failure here is not about PR. It's not about how Israel is spinning the story. It's the problem with the story itself. The narrative cannot be so divorced from reality. You cannot continue to create a reality on the ground, but then sell a completely different narrative killed more doctors in this war, more doctors, more aid workers, than any, journalists, than any other uh, conflict. It's killed 14,500 kids. So that doesn't make sense. When you say Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, well, how can a democracy be depriving the entire population of their human rights? You know, um, when you say IDF is the most moral army in the world, well, how is that true when veteran Israeli soldiers are saying, that what we're doing is wrong, and when, the, when a lawyer from the army comes and says, you know, the behavior is cross, crossing the criminal threshold. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not just about the narrative. It is about the reality itself. And as I said before, I don't care what we call it. You know, you want to call it genocide, you don't want to call it genocide. It's a lot of people dying, and the fact that we're debating whether it is, that's shocking in and of itself. You know, uh, so, so I think what I want people to do is to not just think of a narrative, not, not just say, you know, this is the hero, and this is the villain, to try to simplify it in that way. There's a lot more to it. And, and I think we all need to rally behind a third way that actually puts the people first, beyond the political agendas of leaders or zealots or extremists. So this is an interesting point because we have pushed, hard, hearts have hardened since October 7th, there's no question. So much. Um, and, and you have often brought out, not in just, just this context, but in other contexts, that we are in a world that is polarized and we are pushing people toward the extremes. We are pushing people who might be in that moderate middle, including in Israel and, and, and uh, the, the occupied territory and Gaza. There are fewer people who believe mm -hmm. in a two-state solution in your part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we still talk about it like it's a viable thing that if the United States fully gets behind, it can happen. Mm -hmm. But we also have a narrative that people are either pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, which I was not certain mm -hmm. needed to be the case. I think one can believe in the determination. I think they people should put people first. You know, we, in, what we're demanding, what Palestinians want is not, not sympathy or, or special treatment. They just want the impartial application of the law. You know, uh, what, what people are asking is, you know, yes, there was outrage on October 7th and, and that there should be, but why isn't there outrage about the number of people who are being killed now? You know, why is it okay for some people to have human rights where others are deprived of them? So, and this is something that's actually putting the U.S. in a tight spot because there are some contradictions in the U.S. position. You, you have to give human life equal value and you have to place equal condemnation on human rights violations. You cannot have credibility without moral consistency. And that's what we're seeing here is a, is a, is a global community that is not applying the same standards on different populations. And that's causing a lot of people in my part of the world to feel completely disillusioned and to actually lose faith in, in, the, in the global system where they feel it's not just towards them. But those and folks who, uh, who, who mess this up are those who have been pushed to extremes, uh, anti-Semites who will join pro-Palestinian rallies 
who are not helping the the argument and on the in some of these counter protests as you saw in this city um, you know remarkable violence that doesn't it, it, it doesn't help the dialogue on any front we're, we're going to have to get back to a point where we you might empathize more with one side than the other but you're going to have to have some empathy for everybody Absolutely. Edward Said, he said, just to paraphrase him, that the reality that we're in, the situation that we're in now, is not inevitable. It is a result of choices, historic choices made by men and women. It is man-made, and it can be remade. And I think for us who feel that this is an impossible uh, problem to solve, it is solvable. It is, it's just about, like you said, for us to not just judge the other side as the enemy, but to really try to find the common ground. And the common ground is that we want the same things. And sometimes the things that we want are not the same things that our leaders want. And certainly in this situation, I think, not that they see it this way right now, because obviously the population in Israel are afraid, they feel traumatized, and they've been taught by their leaders that Palestinians are not people like us. Um, they are just you know, security th threats that we have to defend ourselves against. And that is not doing them justice, because ultimately, you know, there's not going to be long-term security. Nothing can save, safeguard Israel and its long-term security as much as a peace can. Um, and so there needs to be a re-education, a rehumanization between the two people. For the time being, I believe that can only be two states and two people living in separateness until they can start to heal and, and, uh, the wounds and to try to build the trust that has been lost now as a result of years of suffering. Um, and we have a responsibility to, to try to, to stand behind a vision uh, that, sees, that delivers to the people there the security and the, and the future they deserve.